All right, I, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, for those of you that don't, that don't know me, I'm Don Krim and I'm a uh, Wyandotte County Extension Master Gardener. Been that for 22 years or so, so I'm one of the old fossils around. Um, my presentation today or the talk is about good and bad insects that we find in our gardens or in um, our landscapes. I can't possibly cover all of the insects that are here, so I have, I guess it's editorial selection here, I have picked what I think are the most common that we find here in Kansas. So uh, that's what my focus is going to be. So we'll go off and running. Why isn't this moving when it's at this There we go. Got it. Okay, here's the things that I'm going to cover today, and I'll get back in the frame. No, you're fine. You're still in the frame. Don, would you like me to sit over there and hit that for you? No, I, I can do it. Okay. Um, we're going to talk about good and bad uh, insects, and I'm also including spiders in that. Spiders are not insects, but they're in a category here, too. And if I get in your way, you holler, will you? No. No? <laughs> um, we will discuss what uh, characteristics make a good or a bad insect. Not all insects are bad, and so the, the uh, uh, fact you have to be careful when you're spraying because sprays don't know whether the bug is good or bad, and so you have to know what you're spraying and what you're spraying for. You have to know what insect is causing your problem, and to do that you have to go out and scout, and that's a term we use in entomology, where you get a net or go out and observe what activity might be of, of an insect. And then if you don't know what it is, the extension office here, the master gardeners and Lynn, can identify that insect for you. All right, there are about 15,000 plus species of insects in Kansas. And less than 5% are harmful in some manner. The rest of the insects are all beneficial or neutral. Now, again, I'm using some editorial thing here. These are my thoughts of what a characteristic of a good and a bad insect is. A good insect is one that benefits the environment or humans. A bad insect is just the opposite. It's harmful to the environment or to humans. Now here's the way some uh, people react or how they deal with insects. Uh, in case you can't read, this first one says, there was a spider, I panicked, but I think it's gone now. <laughs> um, the other thing you may not be able to read, it says the only thing worse than having a spider in your room is losing a spider in the room. Uh, there's a lot of ways of handling it. You can be a, uh, use a fly swatter, you can spray, you can use a pan. But you, sometimes you may need your spouse to protect you with a shoe. <laughs> These are a couple of, or a few of the uh, more common uh, good beneficial insects, the honeybee, the assassin bug, bumblebee. We'll talk about these in a little more in detail a little bit later. The ladybug, which everybody assumes is the most beneficial. And the praying mantis, the ground beetle, and spiders. Those are just a few. We've, I've categorized uh, the beneficials in two categories. First are the, the pollinators, and a pollinator are insects that move uh, from one part of a plant to another plant to pollinate uh, for, uh, while they're feeding on nectar. 
some of the common pollinators, and this isn't all of them that we're going to cover, but flies and hoverflies, beetles, moths, butterflies, solitary bees, bumblebees, and honeybees. The other is, are the beneficial predators. That's another category. And uh, they attack their prey. And they feed a wide variety of pests, and they may consume many times their body weight. Some of the common ones here are lady beetles, spiders, wasps, green lacewigs, assassin bugs, praying mantis, ground beetles, and dragonfly. And we'll talk about these in a little bit. Another picture I thought it, it kind of captured a lot of the, the uh, common uh, beneficial uh, insects. And we'll talk about these as we go along. The first one is assassin bug. Uh, they are kind of ominous, uh, but they are a good beneficial insect. They eat caterpillars and other small uh, insects that are their favorite prey. They are not aggressive to humans, but they will bite if they're threatened. Um, they use that long beak, and um, I don't know how well you can... Uh, there's a beak right there. Uh, they use the long beak to pierce their prey and inject, injure, inject uh, it with a lethal toxin. Uh, green lacewigs. Uh, you'll see that they'll have a term aphid lions, and that's what the, the nymph is called, uh, the aphid lion. And they're, they are known to bite humans, the larva is, if disturbed. Uh, they eat aphids, mites, and other soft-bodied insects. Ground beetles. I have fun with the kids on this one because with the big long mantles up there, they said, oh, that's a bad insect. I said, well, why is that? Is it because it looks bad? Yes. I said, well, you can't always judge a book by its cover. And this is a, a really a good insect. It not only eats other insects, but it also eats weed seed. So it's a beneficial from, uh, from that standpoint too. The mandibles they use there is to catch their prey and to hold them. And their diet mainly consists of aphids, mites, beetle larvae, and even weed seeds. Hover or surfeit uh, fly. Uh, they kind of look like a, a bee, but they're not. They, they are in the fly family. The adult is a pollinator which is the one on the flower there, the larva is a predator and eats the pests. So both stages are beneficial uh, in this particular case. Uh, the larva uh, uh, hover like a, uh, well they don't hover, but the adult hovers like a hummingbird as they drink the nectar. They eat aphids and other slow moving insects. The plants that are attracted, uh, attracted to are wild carrot, queen anne lace, wild mustard, sweet alyssum, and many of the herbs. Probably all familiar with this, the lady beetle. Um, have you all seen what the larva looks like? It's kind of a pretty colored larva. We're going to see in a minute a close relative that is similar. Anyhow, they eat uh, soft-bodied insects, and their, one of their big diets is aphids. And they can consume, and I don't know who did this study, but somebody counted it, I guess, or determined that they eat, could eat up to 5,000 aphids in a lifetime. Now, I don't know how they got that accomplished, but I'm sure someone... I remember when I was going to school back in the Dark Ages, they, there was a study by the USDA to, to determine which end of the egg came out of the hen first, whether it was the large end or the small end. And they found it was 49% one and 51% the other. <laughs> so I can imagine the guy getting paid to do that. Uh, was there. Uh, there's also a book I, I saw at the bookstore one time, Insects Found in Bird Nests. 
And that ought to have been an interesting study as well. So anyhow, there are some amazing studies that researchers do, and I'm sure that they, that's a, a relatively accurate figure. Get a, lot of, get a lot of exercise climbing those trees. <laughs> yeah, I bet that's true. That's exactly right. I don't think I want to get into an eagle's nest, though, however. Um, this is a, a relative of the uh, ladybug. There's a couple of things that are uh, different. This one is uh, both good and bad. The ladybug is red colored. The Asian beetle is uh, orange colored, but they can be multi-colored. They can have a lot of different patterns. Uh, but the distinguishing thing is that they have a W shape behind their head. And if you look at all these other ones, they all have that W. And that's the way you can tell the Asian beetle from the ladybird beetle if you're not sure. And uh, the, the larva is similar, but it's a little bit different. The color pattern is a little bit different. They are aggressive, this uh, little critter, and they can bite humans, but the bite is harmless. I guess you have to talk to the person that got bit whether it was harmless or not. But what they're saying is that you're not going to get a disease or any other skin <coughs> reaction or anything like that. It may exert some pain to you when, you, when it first bites you. Uh, they, it, if they're squashed, they produce a very pungent odor. And if you squeeze them up against a, a curtain, they will stain your curtain. So that makes them a bad insect because they're a, a nuisance in the house. Um, they're larger than the ladybird and, and ha, as I said, and have that distinctive W behind their head. They are a good bed, a bug because they feed on aphids and other small insects, but a nuisance in the house. Brain mantids. I call this the lazy bug. This, this bug doesn't, is not an aggressive hunter. It doesn't hunt at all. It just sits on a tree or on a wall and waits for something to come by. Uh, and so they are a, uh, not an active uh, seek and prey on it. They like crickets, grasshoppers, and flies, but they are uh, considered a, uh, uh, a beneficial. And you don't want to be a male in that species. <laughs> there I am. I'm, I was getting on. Yes? Why, when we were kids growing up, we were told to stay away from those? Uh, are those kind of like the stick bugs? Now, what are you talking about? The prey mantis? Yeah. I don't know. I think people maybe got them confused with stick bugs, but stick bugs aren't bad either. They're, they're uh, a predator. But um, possibly because of their cannibalistic nature uh, of the of the mantid. Yeah, well, it's possible. But uh, I think uh, again, their appearance and stuff looks they look kind of scary. Yeah, uh, look, I think yeah, it, it looks like that. Uh, they look like a bad bug. Yeah, and, and I think that's part of. I don't know. To answer your question, Barbara. I I don't know. Okay. There's a lot of. There's a lot of folk tales and uh, stuff going on about, uh, I came home from school one day uh, and my neighbor was chopping away and I got over to it and he had a snake in a hundred pieces. And he said, that won't grow a new head and tail. He had read somewhere if you just cut it in half, it'll grow a new head and tail. <laughs> Parasitoid and a parasitic wasp. We have a number of them. These are very little and they're, they're really hard to see. They live on uh, either on or inside the host organism at the expense of the host. They don't immediately kill the host. Most lay eggs on or inside the host and then the larva will feed on the host. Most are specialists. They go to a specific uh, uh, particular host to lay their eggs. 
as I said, they're very small and, and hard to see. Tiny uh, uh, parasitoids are more susceptible to insecticides than they are from predators. And most uh, parasitoids are either wasps or bees or flies. Wasps parasitize their prey. And this is <coughs> an example of what they, they do there. The dragonfly. There are 5,000 dragon species in the world. And we have not those all 5,000 here in Kansas, but we have a large number. So I selected two that are the more common ones. The blue dasher dragonfly is one of the most common dragonflies in Kansas. You will find uh, all types of dragonflies around uh, calm or slow moving bodies of water, like a river, a stream, a pond, or a lake, something like that. One of the species I saw, they said they prefer muddy banks, where you have a muddy bank and they, they'll be around that. Blue dasher uh, adults are voracious predators, capable of eating hundreds of insects per day. Adults feed on mosquitoes, moths, flies, and mayflies. And here's an amazing fact. Adults uh, are, they catch, nine, they're, they're considered the world's most efficient predator. They catch 95% of the prey that they pursue. And that's because of their multiple eyes that they have, and it's like 30,000 or something like that, there's a bunch of them, uh, and their double wings that allows them quick movement. And so that's how, why they're such a good predator. And so if you see a dragonfly, thank them for what they're doing out there, because they are eating a lot of mosquitoes. The widow, widow skimmer, which is this other one here, is another real common uh, dragonfly that you see around uh, bodies of water. <coughs> now we're going to get to the bad guys. We have Japanese beetles, emerald ash borers, squash bugs, Squash vine bar, tomato hornworm, aphids, stink bugs, cutworms, grasshoppers, cucumber beetles, cabbage loopers, red spider mites, Asian beetle, ticks, mosquitoes, chiggers, crickets, cockroach, ants, and termites. We've got quite a list there. Grasshoppers. Uh, this is a tough one. Uh, the best stage to try and control the grasshopper is in the nymph stage. If they get to the adult, there's very few control measures that you can do other than physically stepping on them, but uh, that's almost impossible. One of their favorite things is looking at corn, wheat, and wheat, barley, and alfalfa. Back in the 30s, or in that early period, there was a, um, a big influx, or uh, of, well, I'm trying to think of the term I want to use, of large of locust or grasshoppers, and they ate all of the crops in Kansas. And uh, they had a large point that uh, people were actually in a famine and were starving because the grasshoppers had done this type of damage to the corn and to the grain. Uh, they uh, are, uh, the adults, as I said, are extremely difficult to control. Tomato hornworm. We have, we narrow their thing down, they're mostly on the tomato plant, so that's where we will commonly see them. This is a, a hornworm that's been uh, parasitized by uh, uh, a wasp. Japanese beetles, lovely creature. Um, they prefer grapes and roses, but they've been found in over 200 different 
plant species, so they're not particular about what they're going to get on. Um, they've been in this county about 11 years or so, somewhere in that neighborhood, and they've been continually moving westward. This critter right here, during the larval or the grub stage, is damaging to your grass. The adult is the damage to the above ground plant. So they're a double-edged sword here. You don't hear as much with the turf, but they are there, and they do cause damage to your turf if you have them. Here's the life cycle. They start out, here's the grub that's in, in the soil. They move to a pupa, MERS is an adult, feed on the plant, and then they come down and lay their eggs they hatch out to the grub and then we're back to the grub stage again. I don't know how many of you have seen this picture, but they do mass feeding and that's on a row, one rose flower. Um, it's kind of crowded at dinner time it looks like. Squash bugs, I call this the scourge of Kansas. Um, these critters are extremely hard to control. Uh, partially the eggs and the nymphs are both on the underside of the leaf. And many times if people are spraying for squash bug, they spray on the top and don't get underneath where the problem is at. Um, they attack mainly pumpkins, squash, cucumbers. Uh, the squash bug overwinters in garden debris. Now we try to not plant some uh, uh, cucumbers and pumpkins and stuff. Thought so maybe by a, a time or two, by not doing it, they would go away. Silly us. <laughs> they were there just waiting. <laughs> and they can overwinter in the winter. If they have any kind of protection, uh, they will be back. Squash vine vor is a serious pest of vine crops, especially attacking summer squash, winter squash, and pumpkins. Now, I don't know how true this is. is they say that cucumbers and melons are less frequently uh, attacked. That doesn't mean that they don't get attacked. It means that they don't, they're not as frequently as, some, as the pumpkins and stuff. They overwinter as a um, mature larva in a, cocoon, in a cocoon buried in the soil. <coughs> so they're well protected for the winter. Aphids, another scourge. Um, aphids attack the other side of various plants and they secrete the a uh, substance called honeydew. And I don't know how many of you ever had your car parked under a tree that's had aphids in it. It's almost impossible getting that honeydew off your windshield and car. It's a nasty, sticky stuff. So, fortunately, you're not parking your car to garden, but that's a problem for the garden people too. <laughs> aphids like to feed on potatoes, peppers, tomatoes, lettuce, spinach, asparagus, and many flowers. So, they have a wide range of things that they're on. And that guy's always hungry. Stink bugs. They're well named. Stink bugs produce a stinky odor as a defense mechanism from predators. They feed on uh, fruit plants and fruits. They also feed on nearby vegetables like tomatoes, peppers, corn, beans, etc. A few species of aphids are predators uh, of insects that attack other plants, and uh, such as root weevils, Colorado potato beetles, and southern stink bugs. So some gardeners, and there's probably a few, that consider the stink bug predator as a beneficial insect. But for the most part, I think that they're on the bad side. Done. So the, going back to the stink bugs, they're, they because I've seen both of these pictures, there's just different, not let me say styles, different varieties or yeah. different species. 
But they're all stink bugs. So both of those are stink bugs. Yep. Right there. Yep. Yep. I found the easiest way to get rid of those was I, because well, I used to get these a lot in Houston. Was I had a little vacuum cleaner, a little battery powered vacuum, and I'd go out and suck them things off every night, off the uh, plants and the nymphs or the babies. And that is also recommended for the Asian beetle, <laughs> but they said uh, be careful. Don't leave them in the bag because they will do some mating in the bag, and then you got even more. So once you've got them uh, vacuumed up, you've got to get rid of them. And I was saying the same thing with a stink bug, like you were talking about. You need to get rid of them. You can't leave them in the bag because uh, they're going to do what they got to do. <laughs> Cut worms. I don't know, have we had a, much of a problem out in our garden here? Off and on. It's a common problem with the route, and it, it's uh, stuff here. Cutworms attack the new plants just above or just below the soil level. They attack asparagus, beans, cabbage, carrots, lettuce, peas, peppers, potatoes, and tomatoes. So just about all of our common garden products are attacked by the, the uh, cutworm. There are some, if you have just a small uh, garden to protect, you can put a, a piece of cardboard around the base of the plant and that will help reduce the stuff. But if you've got a big garden, that's not a practical solution either. Yeah, Grace. One of the other things I've read is that they'll, they can, they're like eggs can be laid anywhere if the vine touches ground, so trellising would also help as you block off what is has to be at the ground. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's a good question. Cucumber beetle. <coughs> Cucumber, they only live eight weeks, and during that time both the larva and adults feed on plants. Look for holes and yellowing and wilting leaves. The crop yield will be low, and plants will produce a yellow or stunted fruit. Uh, the beetle damage alone uh, won't necessarily kill the plant or cause major damage, but where it comes in, they spread two uh, serious diseases, bacterial wilt and cucumber mosaic, and that's what usually is wind up killing a lot of the plant. Although they can uh, kill a plant too if they get in and do enough uh, chewing on it. Eggs are laid, and that, I, I don't know how Mother Nature has done it, a lot of those insects will lay their eggs on the underside of the leaf. They overwinter uh, in the field crop, crop, in crop fields, compost bins, and trash bins. The cabbage looper, and I'm sure we've all seen those. The cabbage loopers are the serious pets on your cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, and Brussels sprouts. The adult looper is a gray mottled moth with a characteristic white or silver Y on the forewing. Uh, <clears throat> the larva is a smooth greenish caterpillar with thin white lines um, and on, it, on its back and sides. It crawls in a looping back, uh, factor and so that's one way of really determining that's a cabbage looper because of its looping uh, motion. Um, they, unfortunately, they are usually present almost the entire growing season, so they're not limited to a short term. They also attack lettuce, spinach, beets, parsley, potatoes, and tomatoes. Again, so they're not too discriminatory of what they do. Yeah, right? I just have a question. I have found both that solid green and the striped and striped loopers on my are there different species or am I well I'm sure there the is there? it's probably the diamondback larva they're more of a okay. gray green velvety and they don't loop when yeah. they walk yeah. <laughs> spider mites and the thing you have to remember that if you're dealing with spider mites you have to use a miticide and not an insecticide because they're not as effective in the control of them. Uh, they're awful little and they're hard to see sometimes, but the damage is not hard to see. 
so you can see that. One way that uh, they tell you to, to check to see if your plant and its ornamentals as well as the garden is to take a piece of white paper and tap the plant. And if you see, if you see little specks moving around on that, more than likely that's uh, spider mite that's on there. Um, they, uh, they feed on many fruit trees, vines, berries, vegetables, and ornamental plants. The emerald ash borer. It's a lovely little creature. Actually, it's a pretty, uh, pretty looking adult. Um, it's a metallic green adult, about a half inch long. They lay 65 to 90 eggs in a lifetime, but most adults only fly short distances, a half mile to four miles. Yes, well, how on earth did they get moved? <laughs> we are the guilty party. They got moved by people grabbing firewood and taking it to another location. And, that, and then they didn't burn all the firewood up, and they left it back. We had an interesting story here. Lynn had uh, co collected uh, some samples of uh, uh, infested wood, and the following year, we noticed uh, the adult uh, emerald ash bar on our door in the, uh, in the uh, office here. And we're trying to go, how did it get in here? And then it dawned on us, what it, they came from those wood samples out of there. So they uh, survived the winter very easily in a comfy ever the Lynn's office. The life cycle, um, the adults are in August, or May through August. They lay eggs in uh, May to August. Uh, the larva is active and it, it, the way it kills the tree, it gets in just below the bark and to get into biology, remember that there's phloem and xylem feeding tubes. One brings nutrients up to the leaf, the leaf makes food and it goes down to the root. The larva gets in and interrupts those feeding tubes. So the tree is literally starving itself to death. And that's why you'll see the tree die at the, stop, at the top and work down. And it usually takes about five to six years to kill the tree. But if you start seeing your ash tree, and I haven't seen too much on other trees, but it's mainly the ash tree. Uh, if you start seeing it dying, you better get a professional out to look at it and determine uh, if it is emerald ash borer and get it out of there and take the tree down. Yes? A couple of years, well, maybe five or six now, you know, they kept saying that they were really coming through this area, and we lost two beautiful trees. All right. And you could not just cut the tree down yourself. We mm -hmm. had to have professionals yeah. come in and cut them down. One of the things is, and I don't know who does this, we're actually under a quarantine that you cannot move firewood out of this county into a non-quarantine county. Nobody was doing that and everybody was taking firewood to a campsite or whatever. I don't know, have you seen the latest? I think most of Kansas now, not? No, it's about as far as Topeka West. Okay, so it hasn't moved all the way there, but it, uh, I, I'm sure that if you got stopped by the wood police, and I don't know exactly who that is, uh, that there's a severe fine in for moving uh, uh, firewood out of the county. You can go to counties that are already quarantined, like Leavenworth County or Johnson County, you can do that. But you cannot go to one of the, I don't know if Perry Lake, uh, at one point they weren't, but uh, if you went camping to Perry Lake, you couldn't take it there if they were not quarantined. Crickets. In nature, the crickets eat rotting leaves, rotting fruit, um, vegetables, and insects. Once inside the home, they'll eat a variety of fabrics and wallpaper glue. They prefer fabrics with natural fibers such as wool or silk. Aren't they nice? They just are able to determine that. Crickets aren't known to be harmful or dangerous. However, 
if you have one in your house and they're creating a conscience for you when you're trying to get to sleep, they're a bad nuisance. I didn't know this, but I'm not a fisherman. Crickets are one of the most uh, uh, effective baits for sunfish, bluegill, and catfish. So a lot of people grow them as bait for them. So it's good for them for raising for a bait. They're, uh, let me go back. They, again, uh, they're not really much of anything except in the house, and that makes them a nuisance. So from that standpoint, uh, their chirping noise makes them a bad, yes? Um, there's some places now raising them for human food. When what? <laughs> raising crickets for human food. There's some facilities out there. There you are. There you are. These lovely creatures. I think they've been around since the beginning of time. <laughs> you can tell the difference uh, from between a cockroach and other beetles by this one main thing. Their antennae are extremely long. They're long. The only one that would probably rival them are the, the long horn uh, boar beetle. They have a long antennae as well, as well. But for the most part, these are all similar. These show the comparison size of the German and the American uh, cockroach. Those are the two common ones that you find here in Kansas. Uh, the American cockroach is the largest home invading cockroach. They have a figure eight. The American cockroach has a figure eight. That's it right up there. The German has two dark stripes down the back on his back side there. So uh, that's one way to tell the difference between those two uh, cockroaches. If anybody really cares what, what it is, let's be honest. It's like uh, when I talked on the snake, talking about identifying the eye of the snake is telling what it's been. I'm not getting close enough to look at the eye, and I'm running the other way. <laughs> German uh, cockroaches also will eat almost anything, including glue, soap, and toothpaste. German cockroaches, because they travel around in a lot of decay matter and stuff, they can get a lot of germs on their hairs of their leg. So if they're crawling around your food, they could contaminate the food with uh, various diseases. Subterranean. Have any of you experienced the swarms of a, ter a termite? There are uh, also the carpenter ant also swarms at the same time. But there are some easily distinguishing things between an ant and a, and a uh, termite. The ant has an elbowed antennae. The termite has a straight antennae. The ant has an unequal sized wings. Termite are equal. The easiest thing to see is the waist. It ha the ant has a narrow waist, whereas the termite has a solid waist. The subterranean termite caused the most damage of any of the termite species. Here's a mud tunnel, and I don't know how many of you have seen that. They do that for protection, because you see these are very light colored. And so if they're exposed to air or light, that is harmful to them. So in order to get to your house, they have to build a mud tunnel from the ground up to your foundation. So a quick way to see if you've got termite is to check your foundation and see if you have mud tunnels going up there, and that's a strong indication that you've got termites. They are social uh, insects. They have huge colonies. And we talked about the swarming. A colony can have as many as 60,000 to 2 million workers once it gets established. 
If you have an infestation, you need to get a professional out to do it. You can't do it yourself. Several reasons. They have equipment to do it. They have the products that you, that you don't have access to. And they are a difficult thing to get a hold of because they're buried in the ground and they're also in your house. So it's, it's a tough thing. Don, yes. Is it something with the termites? Does it do any good to be proactive, or are you always reactive to them? No, you, you can be. Uh, uh, there isn't any particular spray. There used to be a long time ago, and I know people that did this. Chloridane. They would soak the edge of their foundation with chloridane, and I'm sure that uh, they did it 30 years ago, and I'm sure it's still there today. Uh, because it didn't deteriorate very fast. That was the only proactive thing that I'm aware of, other than going around your foundation, see if you see the mud tunnels, or you see some activity of rotting of, of wood around your soffits or around your window sills or wherever. That's the proactive thing. But as far as control, I'm not aware of anything, are you? When they build a house, they do injections. Around the foundation right. or in the concrete. But how long is that? Five years? Ten? Well, it's probably just like the chlorine. It's not going to break down without sunlight and moisture. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I, I know that um, one thing you can do as a proactive, you can have a professional check your house ever periodically. Mm -hmm. um, there is a fee for that, and I, it's been a long time since I've been involved with it. Uh, and I had I had termites in my house, and I had to have it treated. But uh, uh, you can have them inspect your house and determine whether you have any damage or not. Done. My, my house in Houston had traps, and it was through the pest control company um, in Houston. You know they had a lot more termites down there because of the wetness. And those little green things, they just put them in the ground all the way around the house, and then the guy would come out like four times a year, pull them out, and they were bait. Right. Right. And if there was any activity, then they knew they had to treat. Right. The nice part was because I, my house was new, I hired these guys day one. I was always warranted any damage they would cover. Yeah. Well, that's good. Uh, yeah. No, uh, of course, it never happened because I've been yeah, I know. for 15 and years. It's, it's, a, it's a thing <laughs> to be proactive okay. because uh, okay. you never know. You never know when they come knocking. Yeah, I've seen the damages for you. Uh, also, uh, a proactive thing, if you do have a fireplace and firewood, do not put it up close to your house. Put it way down the, at the other end of the house to store your firewood. Because if you put it right up against your foundation, you just come on in. You are welcome. Black ants eat sugary substances and they're I didn't know this. It's, they said that they're proactive in protecting aphids. So uh, that, I guess, in, in that thing alone makes them a bad uh, insect. They're part of the ecosystem as they recycle nutrients and aerate the soil. And you wonder how they do that. Well, they, they're burrowing down just like the earthworm does. If you have red ants in, the, in your kitchen, they're there for one reason. They found a food source. And they're liking that food source. I've had good success myself with control of red ants in the kitchen with using Terrell. It's a, it's a good product for uh, controlling. It may take several days, but it does get rid of them and they're not there. How do you spell that? T-E-R-R-O. It's, it's at any one of your hardware stores. All have it. And they have little uh, bait stations that you can put out for them. And you have to just be careful uh, where you put your bait station. But you, you notice where the, the line of traffic, like you see here. <laughs> and you can put it in that area. And it's as long as far. They're all crowded around it. This would look like it too. They just come there and they just start feeding on it and they take the stuff back to their colony and feed it to them and that's how it works to control them.
They're a leading predator of other insects. And uh, as I indicated, they move as much soil as earthworms, loosening the soil in that process and increasing air and water movement in the ground. So they're beneficial from that standpoint. Harmful critters to us, us. Mosquitoes, they're in the insect family. The Asian tiger mosquito, the Culex pippins. Spiders in the spider family. The black widow spider and the brown recluse. Ticks, they're in the spider family. Deer tick, the lone star tick, and American dog tick. Chiggers, oh, I love them. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get enough of them. <laughs> and bees and wasps. Mosquitoes. The Culex pippins mosquito is the most common mosquito-borne, uh, well, the Nile West Nile is carried by the Culex pippins, and it's the most common uh, borne disease in Kansas. They're the primary vector in Kansas and in the United States, so they're a very common uh, mosquito, and that's the picture of it there. Again, you're not interested in getting a picture of them when you got one on your bike then. But that's what it looks like. And these are the larval stages. The risk of transmission is lower in the spring and peaks in July, August, and September. Mosquito bite prevention. Drain your standing water. And that means if you've got a tub out there with water in it, empty it out. Uh, if you've got a fish pond, you need to uh, do some treatment there in some manner. Um, if you can't drain the water out of a pond or a lake, you need to use a larvicide on it to control them. Or import in a bunch of dragonflies. <laughs> <laughs> Cover your skin and uh, clothing when outdoors. We're all going to do that. Use an insect repellent such as DEET, but follow the directions. The Asian tiger, and it's completely different than the Culex. It's a carrier of various viruses that uh, are present in Kansas. Zika is one of the viruses, the disease this, mos this mosquito can transmit. Zika is a mosquito-borne virus similar to dengue, fever, yellow fever, and West Nile disease or virus. Most common symptoms of Zika virus are fever, rash, headache, joint pain, red eyes, and muscle pain. Prevention is the same as we had for the Culex. The Black Widow. Uh, yes? Do we have Anopheles mosquitoes around here? Do we have what? Anopheles mosquitoes. They're yes. The, they're the ones that cause malaria. Yeah. Well, I don't know about malaria. I don't know that we've had much uh, with malaria, but uh, West Nile is the, is the most prominent. Yeah. Um, they, the, this Asian, uh, they carry the one, uh, basically is the, is the Zika, it causes the disease. And it's the reason I asked, there's been some press recently about malaria cases. Here in Kansas? Nearby, yeah, not specifically right here in Kansas. Well, uh, in, I, in, you're in, talking in, about in the state. Midwest. Well, that's the Midwest is, <laughs> is a, lot, a lot of the, we, there have been seeing a lot of issues with, uh, and this is both mosquitoes and ticks down in Florida. So there's been a lot that's been moving from Florida up this way. I'm not totally aware of that and maybe Lynn knows more. Uh, I'm not aware of what malaria carrying, uh, but I've, I have read that they are, uh, have had some cases in Florida, but I haven't heard here in Canada. That doesn't mean that they're not. I'm just saying I'm not, I'm not aware of it. I'm sure it's not anything local because I would have remembered. Right, before. exactly, and, and we would have heard about that. I want to tell you something about with the tick when we get to that that the CDC has issued a warning on it. 
black widow. It's the most widely and feared spider species. Specie. The black widow is one of the relatively few spi spider species that can be deadly to humans. Fortunately, these uh, are easily identifiable and their presence in Kansas are limited. The southern black widow can be found in the south part of Kansas or in southeastern parts of Kansas, though it's not common, but, it can, but they're moving this way. These spiders are mainly active at night and can be found in outbuildings, sheds, carports, and other structures. Cold, and we don't have that here, cold Kansas winters can drive them inside the house. So that, to, normally they're outside, but during the winter you could find them in your house. Oh. Sorry. That's okay. I turned it off. <laughs> I don't know why it's okay. But it overrode your, oh, huh? I guess. <laughs> Um, the black widow is named because of its distinctive black body and red hourglass on the abdomen. And I know you probably won't want to be lifting the spider to look at the abdomen, but again, uh, a black spider is an indication for sure. Any idea how big they are? They're, They're very big. little. Okay. They're not very big compared to a tarantula. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever seen this. Well, I don't know. I have either. Uh, body length of like a dime. What? Okay. Body length of a dime. Yeah, that's about right. I would say that right. Body length. A dime. Include the legs. Include. Include? Yeah. So they're that small. With yeah. Legs. yeah, they're not okay. very big. Yeah, that's tiny. And the first sign of a black widow spider bite is acute pain and stinging at the side of the bite. Only the black widow can bite, especially when protecting her eggs. If you suspect you've been bitten, look closely at the area and see if you can see two fang marks, uh, puncture wounds in the skin. The area around the bite may become red and swollen. The brown recluse. It is notorious for a wicked bite and its venom can cause significant pain in people who are bit. The venom of the brown recluse can cause skin damage, including tissue loss and necrosis. These spiders have a, and these are also small, have a body length of one fourth through three fourths inches. That's still pretty good size compared to some ticks and stuff, but uh, they're not a great big spider. Are common in Kansas year round and are found indoors sometimes in large numbers. And these spiders are common household inhabitants through their threat to humans, is, though their threat is minimal. They're usually hidden in a boot, yeah. a, a overshoe, or socks, or something along that order and you put it on and you're unaware that they're in there. And that's why if you do have spiders around, you might check inside your boots and stuff before you put them on. I got bit by a black brown recluse several years ago and that sword that they're showing there, it's right here on my calf, uh, got to be almost the size of a quarter and it took it three to four months to heal up. Did you, did you lose some tissue? They said the oh, tissue yeah. can turn black and, and, and die. Yeah, there was a necrosis. Yeah, yeah. There. It, the sore itself was about the size of a quarter, right? Yeah. Right. What's left of it now is... Uh, here, here it, it will form a blister eventually. That looks like that. And in the center is what turns black and the tissue and the necrosis is in the center of that. They, they call it a bullseye rash that it gets looks like and the center of the of the bite turns kind of clear and then the uh, tissues turn black and dies. Now I didn't mention some of the brown recluses and again we're probably not going to have, take time to be looking at this 
but behind the head there's a violin shape, shape pattern. That is a distinctive ID for a brown recluse. But if you've killed it and you can look at it, you can examine it, you can see if it is a uh, brown recluse. Deer ticks. These are some amazing little creatures. The nymph, or the, the larva, has six legs. The nymph, an adult, has eight legs. So if you get a hold of the larva, you think it's an insect. And in some of the chicks, that's the one that does the damage. But they're truly a spider in the spider family. It's also referred to as the deer tick because the white-tailed deer is its favorite host. They have a two-year cycle from egg to adult. So we have a lengthy a life cycle. There again, the, the larva has six legs and the nymphs and the adult have the nymphs and the adult have eight. The adults are about an eighth of an inch long. Not very big. Unlike mosquitoes, both male and female ticks are blood suckers. In Kansas, these ticks cause Lyme disease. In most uh, cases, a deer tick must be attached for 36 to 48 hours or more before the Lyme de disease bathroom can be transmitted. If you remove the tick quickly within 24 hours, you greatly reduce your chances of getting Lyme disease. Symptoms of Lyme disease include fever, headache, fatigue, and a characteristic bullseye uh, shaped skin rash. Lyme disease can also affect joint, the heart, and nervous system if left untreated. Lone Star tip, same thing. Larva has six legs, nymphs and adult have eight legs. The thing of the Lone Star, I don't know if they came from Texas or not, mm -hmm. but they have one Lone Star there on, the, on their back, and that's the indi in indication ID of a Lone Star tick. Uh, it does not cause Lyme disease, they cause other diseases. Their, ball, their bite can cause a bullseye rash not related to Lyme disease. They transmit what they call uh, Southern Tick Associated Rash Illness, or otherwise known as STARI, S-T-A-R-I. The larva again has six legs. Adults are a fourth of an inch, they're a little bit bigger. Adults are aggressive and will actively search out a host. Whereas the other ticks wait for something to come by, like a praying mantis. Feeding adults do not embed their entire head into their host, only their mouth parts. Symptoms after the bite are similar to Lyme disease, but milder. They are similar to influenza symptoms. There are so many things anymore that are so similar to each other, it's really hard to diagnose what it is. The American dog tick. This uh, dog tick, uh, both nips and adults are known to cause Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Now, <clears throat> the Rocky Mountain spotted fever is not too prevalent in this country. It does happen, but they all of a sudden, they've had five deaths in Southern California. And the CDC has found Mexico is experiencing an epidemic of uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever because of the dog tip. And so they're warning, and the people that die 
all had been into northern Mexico before they contacted the Rocky Mountain uh, spotted fever. So they're warning people to be very careful if they're going into northern Mexico because of the high infestation of the uh, dog tick. The common house dog is the preferred host. And you have to be careful because the dog can be out running and then bring the, the, uh, the tick in the house with him. So after you've had an outing, you're not going to have to check yourself. But if you have a pet with you, you better be checking that pet too because they may have that uh, tick on it. They live up to two years if a host is not found. So they have a long life. They uh, attack humans and typically climb to the crown of the head. American ticks, dog ticks, are typically double the size of the deer tick. And they have more of a flattened shape. Ticks are not able, uh, the dog ticks are not able to feed immediately after latching onto the host. It takes their mouth parts several hours to get deep enough to feed. It is then important to remove the ticks as quickly. If a rice develops as the bite size, as the bite size is a sign of illness. How to safely remove the tick? Use a fine tipped uh, tweezer and grasp the tick as close to the skin as possible. Pull upward with a steady pressure. Don't jerk or twist as the tick could lose and cause the milk the mouth parts to break off in the skin. If that happens, remove the mouth parts with a tweezer. If you cannot, leave it alone and let the skin heal. After removing the tick, wash the area and your hands with rubbing alcohol or soap. Never crush the uh, tick with your fingers. Put the live tick in some rubbing alcohol or place it in a sealed bag or container. And the reason for that is if, you're, if you do get sick, you can take it to a doctor or a professional to identify what it is so they know what they're dealing with. If you receive a fever or rash several weeks after removal of a tick, see your doctor and take that tick with you. I had an experience one day, I worked for farmland and industries for 35 years, and part of their time was at the research farm on K7. We got 200 head of cattle in for a research study, and we were working the cattle, giving them a vaccine and treating them for grubs and so forth. My job was to uh, install a uh, vaccine called BDD, called bovine viral diarrhea. Just as I got ready to vaccinate this uh, steer, someone put an ear tag in him, and he jumped, and I wound up jabbing myself. <laughs> I asked the veterinarian there, I said, what's the, what's the story? He says, well, if you're not dead in 20 minutes, you're okay. I said, well, that was reassurance. And so he said, here, take the vaccine vial and go to the doctor. We went to a doctor in Leavenworth. He said, what happened to you? I said, well, I got, I, I accidentally hit myself with a cattle vaccine. He said, well, what was it? I said, it's bovine viral diarrhea. He said, I don't know anything about bovine. I don't know anything about uh, the viral, but I can take care of the diarrhea. <laughs> I did have, now, I do at feeding time, I want to go move. I, I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but anyhow, that's... Uh, Avoid a lot of this folklore. Do not paint your tip with a nail polish or petroleum jelly. Or use heat with a match or whatever to cause the tick to detach uh, from the skin. Your goal is to remove the tick as quickly as possible and not wait for it to detach. 
Ticks live in grassy, brushy, wooded areas, or even on animals. Be aware there may be ticks in those areas. Before going to those areas, spray your clothing and gear with products containing 0.5 permethrin. Follow the label directions. Do not use, uh, oh I'm sorry, use EPA registered insect repellents containing DEET, percardin, oil of lemon, eucalyptus, or OLE, or paramethylene diol, PMD. Follow the directions. Do not use OLE or PMD products on children under three years of age. Reduce the amount of time spent in potentially tick infested habitat, such as tall grass and shrubs. Stay in the center of pathways so that you stay clear of the vegetation. Keep ticks away from exposed uh, skin by wearing long sleeve shirts, long pants, and high boots. We're all going to do that, right? Okay. Tuck shirts and pants and pants into the socks to cover gaps. When I do that, my wife laughs at me. What's that? Well, that's my idea, but you're saying you're for My pants, my pants and my socks, I always get laughed at. Oh, that's good. You're, you're on it. If you stretch it, if you stretch your socks too much to put it around your pants, they'll go right through the mid though. Well, <laughs> that's, well, that's what I'm saying here. Wear light clothing, so like colored clothing, so you can see the tick a lot easier because they can go through the clothing. Shiggers. I wish I had that a time or two myself. Um, there are at least 46 different chigger species in Kansas. Nearly all of the human misery from chiggers in Kansas is called by an indiscriminate species called the common chigger. So I don't know. Apologize now that I got a place I gotta run to, so thanks for coming. No, thank you. I'll get the last slide. Because I don't know what a chigger is. <laughs> no, you can't see them. They're pretty hard. Have you seen a chigger? No, I, I don't I haven't either, but I've been I've had the result. It's a sick legged stage that bites us. But they have the eight leg, the adult is the eight, eight leg egg. And see how little they are on the skin. They're very small. Chiggers do not suck blood or burrow into the skin. They attach their mouth parts to the skin surface. Attaching begins, uh, itching begins three to six hours after the chigger starts biting. Protection. When possible, avoid areas of tall grass and weeds. Avoid sitting or laying in tall grass or in shaded areas and use an insect repellent. <coughs> Bees and wasps. Even though bees and wasps are good pollinators, they possess a threat to sting humans. Honeybees and bumblebees are not aggressive and will not sting unless threatened. Do not swing and swat at a honeybee or a bumblebee because they're not coming after you for anything. But if they feel threatened, they are going to sting and they die as a, the bumblebee doesn't, but the honeybee does die if they sting. Wasps are a different beast. They are aggressive and they really don't need much of an excuse. Uh, they will come after you and they can sting you multiple times. And uh, they do not die after stinging. I had a personal thing and, that, and it was my own stupidity. I have to admit to that I did. I saw a wasp fly on one of my patio chairs, so I thought I'd see where it was at so I could get rid of it. 
And when I poked my head under there, it didn't like my head under there, so he promptly stung me on my nose. So uh, that was my own fault. I did it. Uh, I was invading his territory or her, and they didn't like it, and so they took care of me. People who are allergic to bee and waste wasp stings are, this is a concern. Some of the flowers that are in Kansas that attract the bees and wasps, they're the indigo bush, the antelope, antelope horns, milkweed, cream wild indigo, pearl, purple poppy mallow, button bush, white prairie clover, and narrow leaf coneflower. Okay, well that's that's the it uh, for my presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, yes. 